about this um, because when I came here my, my hope I mean I, I am the pastor but my hope was that the way in which I follow Jesus I would be able to show you how to do likewise um, and that we would do that together and so as we gather in this space we acknowledge the fact that we believe that following Jesus is the best way to live our lives um, and we're striving together to learn how to do that how to live and love like Jesus so when we gather in a moment like this as a community, as a family, we get to celebrate the life that we're living. We get to practice things that my hope and prayer is that we would practice in our daily lives as we go throughout the week. That this would just be a moment, but it's not the moment. It's just a part of it. It's a part of a whole life. So um, as you're here, for those of you that are visiting or haven't been here in a while, we have some stations around the room. We have the prayer wall. We have a phone that rings. We have candles in the back. We have a new um, uh, great gratitude station over there in the corner, and it's self-explanatory, so feel free to go over there. Um, we take our offering as an act of worship, our tithes and offerings. Um, it's personal. It's part of worship. Um, know that all of our tithes and offerings go to um, the ministry of this church, and we, we are sustained by that. Um, just giving back to God in which he has so graciously given to us. And there's boxes hanging in the back with envelopes for your convenience, or you can always... Um, give online. So um, with that, I want to pray, and then Kristen's going to set up um, our next bit uh, of worship. So let's pray again. Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that we have in our lives. We thank you for this moment. We thank you that you have called us to gather as your people. We thank you for the gift of family and friendship that we're finding here. We thank you for the life in Jesus that we're finding here. We thank you for what you're doing in and around our lives out there each and every day. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time that we have together today, that you would be fully in it, that you would meet us here. Every prayer that's acknowledged by a, a note in a wall or a candle that is lit, Lord, we pray that you would hear those prayers. Uh, Lord, I, I know there's many people that have different things going on, but I want to lift um, Alta up to you specifically this morning. Lord, we love Alta. We know her. She is a saint among us. She's a devoted follower of Jesus, and she's in the hospital right now. So we just pray that her lungs would clear up, the pain would be subsided, and she would be able to return home. Uh, we lift her up to you, and I feel that she would feel a deep sense of your presence, um, us with her. And Lord, uh, we give the rest of this morning to you for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So like the last song said, you give and take away. And I know that sometimes in my own life, it's difficult when I feel like things are out of my control. Um, and so as I, and I, my emotions sometimes will uh, 
reflect what's going on around me rather than a, a piece of just knowing that I'm okay because I know Jesus. And so as we sing the next couple of songs, um, really reflect on just where is your hope? Like, you know, so much can change around us and it can be out of our control. But when we truly believe that Jesus is our cornerstone, when we really believe that our hope comes from him, we can really weather anything. We can be, have peace in the midst of whatever trial comes our way. And that doesn't mean we don't hurt, and it doesn't mean we don't feel those things. Um, and when he's really our center, then we don't lose sight of him. You know, when the sun is shining on us and everything is going well, um, we just can keep him as our constant. And then our emotions aren't going to be, we're not going to be thrown around in, in the midst of our stories. So you can stand if you want, or you can stay seated. For some of us, we may need to hear the lyrics of the songs this morning. For some of us, we may need to sing them nice and loud because we believe them and we proclaim them. And as I always say, sometimes we need to sing these lyrics for those that can't sing. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest phrase, but holy trust in those words again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest praise, but holy trust
Test, 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 test. All right. I love all the conversation and I hate to interrupt it. We should just hang out and talk and eat food. Right? So you can sit with the people you're with or you can move to a different spot with the person you're talking to or you can go back to your, your spot. Because I know we all have our spot. And uh, Jen's going to do our announcements this morning, so let's bring our attention up here. And, and you might need to be that PE teacher right now. Oh, it, I, it works. Yay. I don't have to. <laughs> Save my voice. And get ready, because it's, what, almost a month away? It needs to slow down. Okay. So, hello, good morning. It's great to be with you all. Um, hope you had a place to escape the heat yesterday and today and tomorrow as well. So, hopefully you received your handout. If you have not received your handout, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get one. Um, just uh, There's a couple things that we want to go over on the handout, so if you just take a look at that. If you're visiting for the first time or have yet to complete one, you can tear off. Tear off the connection card and fill it out. Um, provide your info so that we can get to know you, so you can get to know us. Uh, you can also volunteer to serve in many different areas, or you can even let us know how we can pray for you. You can drop this off in the giving box along the wall on your way out. Um, we also invite everyone to experience a July summer Sabbath rest. So during July, we want to establish, as a part of our church, um, a season of rest to ready us for the coming season. Together in spirit and purpose, let's practice three Ps. Play, pray, um, read a proverb each day. Um, the annual Women's Weekend at Mission Springs is coming up. That is Friday, September 29th to Sunday, October 1st. It's a great way to get away for a life-changing weekend. Our desire is to get every woman there, so sign up today at thegatheringchurch.net forward slash events. And last, this Church Without Walls food pantry provided food for 150 plus families this week. Join in blessing others by volunteering to prep and distribute boxes Thursday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, Sunday's food focus is peanut butter and jelly. So bring a few cans of um, peanut butter and jelly and put it on the black heart omelet side. <laughs> um, in the lobby to bless the family in need. And that is all. I got distracted. There's a baby in the house. <laughs> All right, I need gathering kids up here. Let's gather. All right. All right, just as we do every week, they are going to tell you their names so that you can greet them by name after church, and then that makes them feel known. Right, guys? Okay, what is your name? Skylar Nicolette. See? Skylar and Nicolette. All right. Oh, I have an idea. Now you guys tell us your names. One, two, three. Peter. Okay, got it? <laughs> All right. We're going to pray, and then we're going to go have some fun. Okay, girls? All right. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for these children. Thank you for their hearts. And I pray, Lord, that your love that they would feel your love when we're together and that they would learn something more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, give Betsy a hand. All right. So um, if you have a Bible or you're using a Bible app, we're going to be in John chapter 18 at the very end, so verses 33 to 40. And if you're on your phone, I'm teaching from New Living Translation, so if you want to pull that up. But it's always fun to pull up another translation and go, oh, there's more to this than just what Peter read. And we have Bibles in the back if you want to grab one. And some of, some of us don't have Bibles, and so please feel free anytime to grab one of the Bibles um, in the back and take it uh, with you. It is yours. We can always get more. So um, our word for the year is engage. And um, 
if you would like, um, on your way out, if you didn't get the email from us, um, we have a uh, handout back there that is just giving you an update on ministry that's happened so far this year and then our financial update. And I encourage you to take the time to look at that and, um, and be praying about some different things that are prompted in there. Um, but know that as we engage our facility in this community, it's just a great example of how when you join God in what he's doing, God provides, God sustains, it bears huge fruit. The verse that goes with engage that we've been using is draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So when we draw close to what God is doing, he's there. And it's crazy how this works. Um, I was with a bunch of our pastors in our denomination at our um, annual meeting, which is a lot of business. I had to sit through business stuff from 8 in the morning until 5 in the evening, if you can imagine Peter sitting for that long. And, uh, and we voted on things and stuff. And it was great because I got to hear a whole lot about ministry. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting is in the United States, they were just sharing about there's a huge decline in the church. I mean, it's just declining and declining and declining and declining. And most churches are not knowing what to do. What do we do? We have this building, we have some people, but this, it's not working per se the way it used to, that many of us are accustomed to. And so we're talking a lot about, and I was able to say, you know what, we're, we're doing it a little bit different in that we're still this, but we've allowed our building to be a community center. And our finances are really small, and yet God is doing amazing things in providing, in providing. There was a huge memorial service in here yesterday for a family that didn't have a place to do it, and we were able to open up this place and do that uh, for them. Our food pantry continues to flourish I have a relationship with our new mayor, so if you ever see him, say thank you. Um, but he's aware of our storage issues back here for food, and I was on the phone with him this week, and we have a donated 20-foot um, refrigerator cargo container, free, being donated. I know before I got here, there was a discussion that no one should park in our parking lot. Many of you were here then about gating our parking lot. Um, I, I don't live that way. Post office parks in our parking lot all the time. I don't know if you notice that. Um, all kinds of people use our parking lot for many things. When they're having memorial services across the street, and there's not for, people park in our parking lot. We do the food pantry through our parking lot. Lions Club does their fundraisers through our parking lot. How does God continue to bless us in ways that, that we may not be able to do it ourselves, where we might have to go, where are we going to get this? Um, Steve, where are you? Steve Brooks, where are you? Steve Brooks is the president of Lions Club, or was. We just made the pass, right? And every year, the, the president of Lions Club gets to pick a project. And because we've been community-centered, not church-centered, we've been community-centered, Lions Club did our parking lot. We didn't pay a dime. <laughs> now, Steve's connected to our church, but you need to know um, the Lions Club, when he shared that and asked that of them, um, and he gets to pick what he wants to do, they were unanimous and like, yes, we need to do that because this place blesses our community. Think about that. I love that. So know that this idea of engaging and opening ourselves up and being a part of our community instead of being a separate community, God is doing amazing things in that. All right. So here we go. Um, artificial intelligence seems to be a big thing now. I heard that there were traffic jams in the city because there's Google cars, driverless cars that take people from point A to point B and because there's not a human behind the wheel, it's creating traffic jams. Um, we, we know if we've watched movies, I mean, you can go all the, all the way back and I'm going to really age myself out here, but there was a movie called 1984 that came out that was based on human intelligence, and it was very <laughs> prophetic, by the way. Um, there's movies like RoboCop, if you like RoboCop. I mean, again, I'm dating myself. To me, that seems like a current movie, but it's probably not. And there was RoboCop 1 and RoboCop 2 and so forth. Maybe some more current ones, Chappie, Ex Machina, Transcendence, The Machine. There's this thing called artificial intelligence, and it refers 
to simulating or approximating our human intelligence in machines. The goal of artificial intelligence is that it would, it would help us learn, it would help us reason, it would help us perceive things, but the reality is it's being used to do that itself, to understand and perceive and learn from itself through an algorithm. It's being used in finance, it's being used in healthcare. Think about it, you go into surgery, a human being may not be doing the procedure. A machine might. I mean, it's being used in so many different ways. But there's a lot of discussion about that right now because people are concerned. There's, there is a danger to it. There's these blessings to it, but there's this concern on the other side here. Those of you who are school teachers, you know what I'm talking about. Did you know that there are apps you can download on your phone and I can go, make a resume for Peter Douglas Foster. And it'll search through all that's on the internet without me giving them any information, and it'll create a resume for Peter Foster. And I didn't have to do it. Think about that. I get an essay topic at school. I speak it into the computer, and it writes an essay. I, was, I meet with some college guys, Gabe and Matt and Brandon, and Brandon knows a lot about it, and I just threw a topic at him and began to generate a paper. The danger with this for us and our society, and it is a danger, is we may lose our desire to ask questions and find answers for ourselves. We won't have to think anymore. We're going to rely on someone else taking our question and answering it for us. It's pretty scary. It's pretty scary. We can get really lazy and begin to rely on it, and then you begin to realize that if it's searching the internet for us, where is it getting in its information? And then what is truth? What is truth? Uh, an algorithm <laughs> is defining our truth. I believe we need to always be asking questions, always be asking questions and seeking answers for ourselves and not relying on other people to do that. It's important for us to do that in our everyday lives, but it's important for us to do that in the midst of our faith. We're in the Gospel of John right now, and John wanted us to know, love, and follow Jesus. And to know and love and follow Jesus, you need to know that Jesus provoked questions. By the way he lived and the things he said, he provoked questions. He was being questioned all the time. Just read through the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's getting questioned by the religious leaders all the time, and even others, because they're like, this doesn't make any sense to us. And when he was challenged by those who thought they knew the truth, he wouldn't answer their question with an answer. He would answer their question with a question. And it was through that that he revealed his heart, the heart of God, the heart of the Father, revealed answers to us. It revealed a world, a kingdom, that looks very different from the world that we live in. Jesus revealed what he called the truth. He embodied a life of love and compassion and grace and mercy that redeemed our ongoing relationships with one another and our relationship with God. So let me set up the context for our passage that we're going to look at today. I'm trying to get my thing to move without doing other things. So if you were here last week, we talked about a short chunk of scripture where the Jewish leaders who had agendas and motives lived a certain way. They had their truth. They brought Jesus, who wasn't living into that the way they wanted to, and they brought him to Pilate, and Pilate was a Roman, and he had his motivations, and he had his truth and everything, so their truth and their truth are in conflict, and then you have Jesus that is the truth, right, in the middle of it. And, um, and the Jewish leaders are basically saying, we don't want to have to deal with this. We can't kill him, but you can and so Pilate's not just going to act on this. I believe Pilate takes the time to ask some great questions. So let's read from verse 33 um, to the end of the chapter. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. So if you remember last week we were talking about this, that the Jewish leaders and Pilate met outside of the Roman stuff because if you went in there, you would be defiled, you'd be considered unclean. So it's interesting that Pilate invites Jesus into uncleanliness, messiness, and Jesus goes. 
He doesn't say, I can't go in there. He enters into that spot. Jesus was brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. Jesus replied, is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom's not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders, but my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. And Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. What is truth? Pilate asked. Then he went out again to the people and he told them, He is not guilty of any crime, but you have a custom asking me to release one prisoner each year at Passover. Would you like me to release this king of the Jews? But they shouted back, Not this man. We want Barnabas. A little subtext is Barnabas was a, a zealot, a religious revolutionary, and they chose him over Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for uh, Jesus. Thank you for this moment that we have. I pray, Lord, that, um, that all I have to share this morning um, would be helpful, truthful, and pleasing to you. Open up our hearts and minds to receive that which you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, before I came here, I was teaching world history at Mount Diablo High School in Concord. And um, I realized the kids in my class were just, they'd get information, they'd regurgitate it, they'd get re- information, they'd regurgitate it. We're just in this weird cycle, and I'm like, okay, I don't roll this way. I want you guys to love history as much as I love history. I want you to, to want to know it. And so I was looking around for something, and uh, there was this method of, questioning. And I forget the title of the book I got, but I got this book and I go, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I tried it. So, I'll give you an example. We got to a unit on World War II. I had them in groups and we're given the worlds, World War II. And they had to generate as many questions as they could in, pertain- in pertaining to that World War II. And then they identify their three best ones and then their best one. And we would share them. When was World War II? Why was there World War II? Was it in the world? What is meant by number two? And so forth and so forth and so forth. We'd generate those questions. I'd put them on sheets of paper and we'd put them all around the room. And then as we began to look at World War II, we were seeking the answers to their questions and guess what they learned and they learned and they learned and they were hungry for it and I didn't have to I didn't have to give it to them they wanted it from me and I told them you're not going to just get it from me I want you to read books you're going to research things and it was awesome it was awesome so I love this in the midst of a real storm Pilate takes Jesus aside and he asks Jesus four great questions Pilate knew just as a leader, you don't reach conclusions without asking questions. I'm not going to kill this guy until I get the answers to my questions. So the first two questions that Pilate asked, who are you and what did you do? Who are you and what did you do? He asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that who you are? And I love Jesus' response. He says, first, are you asking for yourself? Like, are you asking because you want to know who I am, who I really am? Or are you asking because they told you that I'm that? There's an element of curiosity that Jesus sees in Pilate, even though Pilate may not act on it, is that maybe this Pilate guy wants to know. And we don't know a whole lot about Pilate in terms of the whole rest of the story, how he felt and what he thought as he witnessed what we know happened. What have you done, Jesus? What did you do? I remember (laughs) I'd come home from school with a detention note when I was in elementary school. And my mom would say, what did you do? (laughs) 
I didn't do anything. I didn't do, I didn't. You had to have done something. What did you do? So can I read? I'm going to read to you what I wrote in my journal, just my paraphrase of Jesus' answer to Pilate's question. What did you do? I revealed a kingdom unlike anything in this world. If it was like the kingdoms in this world, and I was a king, my followers would be fighting for me right now. They would be storming this place to set me free. But they're not. So if you say I'm a king, if you say I'm a king, my kingdom isn't like anything in this world. I'm here to embody the truth. And everyone who recognizes me and loves my truth and knows that what I've been saying in word and action is true, then my kingdom is here. My kingdom is here. Third question Pilate asks, what is truth? And I can't read into the words, but I almost feel it's sarcastic because there's no conversation after that. It's like, what is truth? He's not even getting what Jesus is talking about. What I love about Jesus is that he knows who he is and he knows what his purpose is. He came to embody the truth, God's heart. He came to fulfill God's purposes, God's purposes. And that was to bring God's heart back into the world. People had pushed it away and reestablished in all of his creation, his heart, even if others wouldn't recognize it. Think back to this in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus opens with these words. It opens up the gospel. He says, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe. And all repent means is the way you're living this way isn't the right way. I am the kingdom, so look at me, turn and go this way. Believe, follow in faith. The kingdom is here, and it's here in me. So what do these questions mean for us? So I'd ask us to reflect on this a little bit. I asked everybody up here this morning this question, our volunteers, before we prayed. Who is Jesus in your life? Who is Jesus in your life? Jesus asked the disciples that one time. He said, who do you say I am? Because he knows he was hearing all kinds of things. Jesus said, you know what? If you submit to a master, you're going to have to submit to a master. You can't serve two. You're going to love one and you're going to hate the other one. You can't serve two. And Jesus being referred to as a king, as a lord, is Jesus lord of our lives? Is Jesus king of our lives? Who is he in your life? Is he just a good man with teachings to follow? Is Jesus your friend and buddy? Is Jesus simply the Savior who died on the cross so that you could go to heaven and that's it? Or is he the Lord, the King, who sacrificed his life so that he could reign in your life, so you could become like him and establish his kingdom in your heart and the heart of this world? What has Jesus done in your life? Or is Jesus doing anything in your life right now? Do you recognize that Jesus might be doing something in you or around your life? Is he doing anything? Because he came to do something. And if we just believe, but it's not doing anything, I don't know why I'd believe in it. Why would you believe in something that's not doing anything in your life? Jesus said these words, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. An abundant life. Most of us think in terms of abundant life the way the world does. And Jesus' world is different. And the Apostle Paul tells us how it's different. He says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. No matter what the circumstances are in my life, I've learned how to be content. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Abundant living contentment is found in the truth of Jesus. So what is Jesus' truth? 
as Pilate asked that sarcastic question. The truth is embodied in a person. The truth we're looking for is embodied in Jesus. Okay, that's like out there. I was watching some videos the other night. You know, you have your YouTube feed and things come up that is recommended. And for some reason, I don't know why, I'm getting after-death experiences. I don't, know, I don't know what that means. But these are people who have died and experienced something, and then they come back. And I was watching this one. She encountered what she thought was Jesus, but it was hindered by what she thought Jesus should look like. But she knows she encountered the presence of Jesus, but didn't recognize what she was seeing. And this voice spoke into her life. You need to go back. You're not done. Remember this. Love and compassion are all that matters. Love and compassion are all that matters. It's the only measure. When God looks at our life and Jesus looks at our life, that is the measure. Love and compassion. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for compassion is a noun, it's a verb, and it's an adjective. That violates all of our English rules. And it comes out of a word in Hebrew for the word womb, meaning to draw out the nature of God. To have compassion means to bring the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, in our lives and through our lives through the gift of the Holy Spirit that we might be able to live that out and experience that in our lives. We have a Catholic church here in town called Sacred Heart. And I've always wondered why how they name those. Like, I can go in any town, there's a sacred heart, there's a sacred heart, there's a sacred heart. Like, what, what is that? And I was curious, so I researched it. And I don't know if I'm going to get this right, so those of you who have a Catholic background might be able to correct me, but this, from what I read, is what, what I got. A sacred heart means the center of love, both physically and symbolically. It means the wellspring of love that flows from an abundance of compassion. And it's symbolized by a burning flame. It also stands for mercy and grace. But mercy and grace begin with compassion. Jesus challenged us, challenged his followers. Know the truth and the truth will set you free. A time is coming when you will worship in spirit and truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one will experience the kingdom without me. Compassion, love. Compassion and love. Jesus' life is filled with and embodied in so many different ways in which he revealed his kingdom. We have the story of the leper, who because he had a skin disease, which we know today to be different, but that skin disease made him unclean and made him impure. People knew they couldn't be around it based on their religion, and they, they made them outcasts. And they didn't like the smell that came from the flesh, so they put them on the other side of even their garbage dumps where they tried to sustain their life at the dump. A leper hears of Jesus and a leper comes to him and everybody is like, oh my gosh, unclean, we got to get out of here, don't go near this man. And Jesus goes to him who has not been touched or had human presence except those that are like him. And Jesus reaches out with compassion and love and touches him. Everybody who had to witness that, crazy. Crazy. Another time you have the woman who's caught in the act of adultery and she's brought in front of Jesus. She messed up. And the religious leaders are calling it out. She messed up. Throw her in front of Jesus. What do we do with that? And they know the law says we're supposed to... Stoner. They're all holding rocks, ready to throw them. And Jesus starts drawing in the ground. Who knows what he was drawing? Maybe he was writing their names down. I don't know. 
And then he says to them, he was without sin. You throw the first rock. And what happens is they all drop their rocks from the youngest to the oldest. And they leave. And Jesus looks at her. She said, where's your accusers? She looks up, they're gone. He says, go and sin no more. Go live life. Compassion and love. There's a time where Jesus is in somebody's house and they're teaching and they have, there's these friends and they have a friend who's a paralytic. He's been that way his whole life and they go, oh my gosh, if we can get this guy to Jesus, man, if we can get him to Jesus, Jesus could heal him. Our friend could walk again and they get there and it's too crowded, they can't get in. They take him up on the roof. We know the story. Many of us know the story, right? They tear off the roof. Break into this religious moment, all these people asking Jesus' questions, and they lower him down. And everybody's like, oh, what's Jesus going to do with this? And many are struggling with the fact that they know, oh, he's going to forgive this person's sin because sin is why they're this way. It's got to be. Or Jesus could just heal him, and he knows he's in a situation with both. So he says, so that you will know that I have the power to forgive, and the way I'm going to forgive, get up and walk. And the guy gets up and walks out because of the faith of his friends. If you want to know truth, it's found in Jesus. The truth we're being told today, is in, is, we're suspect of it, Right? What is the truth? That is like the huge question in our culture. What is the truth? I watch this new station, that's my truth. I watch this new station, that's my truth. I hang out with people who think like me and feel like I do. Our opinions are the same, that's my truth. And we fan the flame on that truth. I'm here to tell you the truth is compassion and love. And that ought to be our filter in everything. You want to know truth? If it's not loving and it's not filled with compassion, grace, and mercy, I don't know. Think about all the stuff we're hearing. Is it loving? Is it compassionate? Is it filled with grace and mercy? If it isn't, it's not the truth. Final question that uh, Pilate asks. He goes to the people and he says to them, I don't find anything wrong with this guy. Pilate's going, I've got a way out. Because I don't want to kill this guy. He, he's not done anything. He's no threat. And they have the tradition of releasing a prisoner during Passover. Which is why they're all in Jerusalem in the midst of this. So he thinks, oh, they're going to pick Jesus for sure. So he brings, they bring Barnabas out. This bad guy. I mean a bad guy. And the way the movies depict him, he looks crazy. And Jesus, Who's, who do you want me to release? Jesus, your king, or Barnabas, the criminal? And they chose the criminal because they couldn't receive the truth of Jesus. Who do you want to release? So my question for us as we end this morning. What if... We choose to release the compassion and love, grace, and mercy of Jesus into our lives. I mean, let it wreak havoc in our lives. Open up our lives and go, I am loved. There's grace and mercy for me. I need to have compassion on myself. What if we unleash, we release that in us? What if we Allow God to use us to go out into our world and release love, compassion, grace, and mercy into the lives of others. What if we release that? What would happen? What would happen? What if we made that our algorithm? Everything that's going to run through me is going to be about those things. How might it change your life and how may it change the life in the world? We are looking to the world to solve everything. When the truth is Jesus, and he's right here, right now. And we have the choice to release him in us and through us or not. The world, the world's ways are not going to solve it. They're not going to solve it. Our politicians, our leaders are not going to solve it. 
the solution abides in us. It abides in me and together it abides in us. And if we'll just do those things, remember those words when you leave today, love, compassion, grace, mercy. Release it. Release it. So that's what I had today. And as I always do, I want you listening. What is God saying to you? And then what are you going to do with what you heard? So take a moment just to reflect. What did you hear this morning? And what do you think God wants you personally to do with what you heard? On the night that Christ was betrayed, and he was sitting at a table with all of his devoted followers who were wanting to be like him. He gave them something to remind them of him that we're called to do every time we get together. So we will not forget. And I believe there's truth in it. Christ's body broken for us. Truth. Talk about compassion, grace, and mercy. Christ's blood poured out for the forgiveness of sin, the cup. Love, compassion, grace, and mercy. That's meant to remind us that Christ did that for us so we could live that way. He ushered that, the heart of that, into our world today. So as we take communion today, think about those things. Um, we try to discern on Sundays who will um, hand out communion serve us. So Kristen, who? Who? Carl and Kay. Carl, would you mind coming up to this table? And Kay, where are you? So when you come up, um, after I pray, you'll just come up to the table. So you guys can hold it or leave it at the table, whatever you feel, feel best doing. And they're going to say the body of Christ broken for you. You can take the bread. And then they're going to say the blood of Christ shed for you. And you can dip it in the cup. And today we're making it personal, so you may take and eat, and then we will sing um, a song in the midst of that. So let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the life that he lived. We thank you for the life that he gave. We thank you for that ultimate sacrifice. We thank you for his victory over death. His victory is our victory. We thank you for the gift of the table, the sacredness of the ta table. We can come to this table living in the midst of muddy water and know that you are at work cleaning that water in our lives and around our lives. So Lord, as we take and we eat, we honor, we honor your son Jesus and the compassion and love of your heart for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Feel free to come up whenever you're ready.
someplace cool to chill. So know that Peter Foster has a large swimming pool and no children. So anybody, please, we're going to be there hanging out. Please feel free to come by and escape the heat. But otherwise, find some place. I was thinking yesterday about just walking around Walmart. Just going in and walking around Walmart. They, they crank that AC. Maybe bring a beach chair, buy a soda, sit in the recreational area of Walmart. I don't know. Anyway, and just a reminder too, as you go out, financial update. Um, and ministry update, if you didn't get it in the email or you don't read or get email, there's one out there in the corner of Coffee George's table. Blessings. Go live in love and compassion. <laughs>